Turning the page, as the Trump chapter draws to a close, markets and the world anticipate how a chapter written by President Biden will read. Welcome to a special edition of Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, Governor Ned Lamont of Connecticut. In terms of support, what we need is let's put in place a really strategic vaccination plan. Let's fund that so all of our, our 50 states are working you know, in lockstep. Special contributor Larry Summers of Harvard. I think that supply shocks can be both good and bad. We may have a good supply shock to think of it as uh, saying that data is the new oil. Former Education Secretary Margaret Spellings. Former Energy Secretary Ernest Moniz of MIT. President-elect has said uh, as a day one action uh, would be rejoining the Paris Accord. Former Federal Reserve Governor Dan Tarullo of Harvard. And Richard Highs of the Council on Foreign Relations. Each week, we look back on the past seven days and what they have meant for global Wall Street, what hopes they have raised, what challenges they have presented. But this week, as we approach the end of the year and those in the United States celebrate the holiday of Thanksgiving, we look forward rather than back to new ideas and new policies that come with a transfer of power in Washington. I pledge to be a president who seeks not to divide, but unify who doesn't see red states and blue states, only sees the United States. We look forward to what we need to do to rebuild a badly damaged economy. And even as we try to recover, lay the foundations to go beyond recovering what we've lost and building back bigger and better for the future. But before we can do any of that, we need to confront the perils of the coronavirus pandemic that is very much still with us, even as our hopes have risen for one or more vaccines in the coming months. And so we begin with the coronavirus, where we are now, what the coming months are likely to hold, and how we can get to the other side with one of the governors who has been on the front lines in that battle, Democrat Ned Lamont of Connecticut. We had the lowest infection rate in the country up until uh, a couple of months ago. And like the rest of the country, we are creeping up now. As you pointed out in the introduction, last time around, it was regional. It was regional to uh, this part of the country early on, and for us, the southern part of the state. It's no longer regional. There's no elsewhere. There's no place for us to get nurses from or PPE. It's in all 50 states and it's in every single town in the state of Connecticut. Well, I was going to ask about that, the distribution. Uh, I've actually been looking at a, a chart that you put up that with, a, that with red for more than 15 cases per 100,000. Pretty much the whole state is red. Is there any variation, either according to geography within Connecticut or with respect to demographics, age, for example? Uh, we're doing so much more testing, well over 200,000 tests a week now, that um, we are detecting uh, the virus earlier. We are, do have a younger demographic we're seeing. We're getting those folks quarantined earlier. Uh, if folks go to the hospital, we're detecting that earlier. They're spending less time in the hospital, all of which is good news. But um, I'd say the spread, the community spread is pretty um, broad. And it can be in an urban area like Bridgeport, Connecticut, or a more rural area like Norwich, Connecticut. Uh, let's talk about where you go from here, uh, specifically with respect to the vaccine. We've heard a lot about vaccine that may be coming, where there's hope on the way, although it looks like we're going to have a tough time getting there as a practical matter. I, I actually read that your acting uh, head of public health uh, said that you don't have the money for the distribution right now. Is that right? Uh, look, there's no federal money. There's not much federal money. So we're working it as best we can. Uh, Deirdre Gifford is amazing. She's leading our vaccination committee. But if uh, the feds don't step up, we do have a $3 billion rainy day fund and it's raining germs. And this is the, we're not going to pinch pennies when it comes to getting the vaccine out to everybody as needed. What are you looking for from the Biden administration? Let's jump ahead just a little bit to January 20. Uh, what would you like to see from the Biden administration? What do you hope for? What do you need? Uh, number one, let's all speak with one voice when it comes to the mask, when it comes to social distancing. Uh, we had a dissonance over the last uh, you know, eight months, and that was a confusing message to people. You know, number two, in terms of support, what we need is let's put in place a really strategic vaccination plan. Let's fund that so all of our, our 50 states are working, you know, in lockstep and we get this done appropriately. 
and thirdly, some state and local aid, in particular for the uh, small businesses to help us power through so we can avoid what could be a real knee-knocking recession. Uh, let's talk about what it's ch- how it's changing uh, Connecticut, and particularly who lives in Connecticut. What, what are you seeing in terms of immigration into Connecticut, for example, from New York, and for that matter, outgoing from Connecticut to other states? I think we've added probably 30,000 families have moved into Connecticut in the last uh, five or six months. Um, Overwhelmingly coming from New York, uh, they want a less congested uh, environment, uh, maybe a backyard, maybe it's easier to self-quarantine. Our schools are open. So, but I, I don't wish ill of New York. We're part of the greater New York ecosystem. To me, it's still the global capital of the world, and we're going to work through this together. Governor, you mentioned the 30,000 families that have moved into Connecticut. Have you had some outflow, particularly because of the tax situations? We've heard reports that some people would like to move to, for example, Florida. Are you losing prominent people from Connecticut? Well, first of all, um, the number one state where people leave Connecticut to go to is New York. Hmm. Uh, I think we're all part of the same uh, regional system there. Then it's California. But you're right, Florida, people of a certain age, um, uh, they do migrate to Florida. They've been doing that um, before we had an income tax and after we had an income tax. But I'm just really pleased that Connecticut's getting uh, younger. A lot of young families move into this state. Uh, I feel like we've got uh, the wind to our back there, and we've got to take advantage of that. You mentioned earlier, Governor, your rainy day fund. Talk about that, because there were projections that I think were like $2.5 billion deficit or something in August, and now you're down to $1 billion. I think your credit rating has actually improved as a result. How'd you do that? Well, uh, we, we put in place a rainy day fund, uh, so the legislature couldn't spend that money, and we had a savings in case there was a crisis. Or if revenues collapsed, we wouldn't have to raise taxes or slash social services. So we've got about 15% of our budget um, uh, salted away. But this is the time probably to put it to use, especially when it comes to public health, especially when it comes to more testing, more track and trace, and more vaccination support, you know, until uh, President Biden steps up and uh, gives us some federal relief. So you don't have that federal relief yet, at least. What's happened with the employment by the state of Connecticut, public employment? Uh, we're not filling any jobs at this point. So our, um, our overall state workforce is, um, you know, down a little bit. Uh, overall employment, our, our GDP stayed pretty whole, David. We've got up to 88, 90 percent of our GDP is back. We kept manufacturing going, kept construction going. Like I said, retail is back. But if restaurants had to close, and that's a regional decision, that would impact unemployment big time. One of the issues that we almost forgotten about now is the so-called uh, state and local tax, the SALT uh, treatment and the tax cut of back in 2017. Uh, do you expect that the Biden administration might turn that around, and could that help your state of Connecticut? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, SALT um, implemented um, in the Trump administration was probably the biggest tax increase our state has seen and our region has seen in a, quite a uh, long while. And uh, I know that... Um, I'm, I'm here in Greenwich, let me tell you, they talk about these type of things uh, all the time. Uh, the good news for us is um, we ended last year with a small surplus. We've got the rainy day fund, uh, no plans to raise any taxes. So at least people here in Connecticut have a certain sense of certainty that we plan for the situation we're in. That was Connecticut Governor Ned Lamont. Up next, The need to take on big tech is one of the few things that Republicans and Democrats appear to agree on. We hear from Harvard's Dan Turullo about how the Biden administration might explore a new way to do just that. If it defined what are fair and unfair practices without getting to structural breakup. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is a special edition of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Lawmakers on both sides of the aisle agree that big tech needs to be reined in. Just weeks before the presidential election, the Justice Department filed an antitrust suit against Google, claiming it monopolized the market for Internet search, a claim that is unlikely to go away whether or not the Biden administration pursues the case. If you're going to build a startup, you need to you need to be able to have fair rules on the Internet around how you can compete, how you can get customers, how you can uh, innovate. 
And it wasn't just competition that was at issue. The CEOs of Facebook and Twitter were grilled by the Senate on how they handle political content and misinformation on their platforms, less than a week before the presidential election. Senators pressed them on whether they should amend Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, a federal law from 1996 that effectively shields social media companies from liability for content posted by their users. Section 230 is the most important law protecting internet speech. And removing Section 230 will remove speech from the internet. President-elect Biden, speaking to the New York Times early last year, referred to Facebook as an example of a tech company taking advantage of Section 230, saying, quote, it should be revoked because it is not merely an internet company. It is propagating falsehoods they know to be false, and we should be setting standards not unlike the Europeans are doing relative to privacy. I asked Dan Tarullo, former Federal Reserve Board governor, about how the Biden administration might take a different approach to regulating big tech. I would assume that uh, Biden appointees will share some of the concerns about big, arguably monopolistic uh, tech practices that have been discussed in policy circles for quite some time now. Uh, the question of how they'll proceed, and, and I don't have any, and certainly any inside information on it, but the question of how they'll proceed is an interesting one, because they are, after all, facing a judiciary that is heavily populated with uh, judges who are not sp especially sympathetic to innovative antitrust ideas. It raises for me the question as to whether the Biden administration, through its appointees at the Federal Trade Commission, may want to uh, look at the use of Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act, that's what, that's what addresses unfair methods of competition, to do some rulemakings. Rulemakings could help in a couple of ways. One, it could define what are fair and unfair practices without getting to structural breakups or the like with some of the high tech companies. But secondly, they could use them to start establishing through a notice and comment process what are unacceptable practices for a dominant tech supplier in this new world in which they're not charging their users, but they're using the data of users. So I think, as we were talking earlier, that's one of those avenues that has been unexplored that wouldn't require congressional action that might be profitable for the new administration to look at. Well, this is a terribly important point for people who are not necessarily au courant with the difference between the Sherman Act and the FTC Act, on the other hand, because a lot of talk has been, and there's been a lot of talk about the fact that the courts have really adopted sort of a Chicago stool of analysis that really is based on prices to consumers, and that may be a roadblock to really going after big tech. But as you point out, the FTC is not just enforcing the same act, it has its own act and it's its own process going up to the FTC itself for rulings. So that might be a different way to get a different approach to antitrust. Yeah, that's right. And, and it hasn't been utilized at the, at the FTC. It's been one of those things that uh, they haven't used, they tended to use their Clayton Act uh, authority much more, that is to stop mergers. Um, but this, I think it has a particular attraction now, David, not only because of the potential resistance of the judiciary, but also because many people ask the question, well, how effective would a breakup be in and of itself? Might you just have, as we saw in telecommunications, the restructuring of an industry which leads to a tight oligopoly rather than to a monopoly? Uh, the FTC Act would, might provide a way for the government to define what are acceptable and unacceptable practices by a tech company that has huge network externalities and huge economies of scale. What about the area of regulation that you were directly responsible for at the Federal Reserve, that is financial, the financial industry? Uh, President Trump came in and said, we're going to deregulate some of that. There were moves made. How much was done under President Trump? How much needs to be redone now under President Biden? Well, there are two separate issues there, David. One is, to what degree have uh, the large banks been deregulated over the last four years? And then, where do we see vulnerabilities that haven't been addressed at all? And with respect to the former, although there haven't been many headline-grabbing uh, deregulatory moves, and some of them get announced on Friday afternoons, and so they miss the, miss the news cycle, um, there has actually been quite a lot uh, done to undermine supervision, to make the stress tests easier and more predictable, uh, to remove some of the constraints of the leverage ratio. Uh, 
uh, a lot of those things have been done. And I think Biden appointees will be focused on uh, reclaiming that, that area, particularly when it comes to the capital position of banks. I mean, did we need any better indication of the importance of high capital levels than in March when the banks were a source of stability rather than a vulnerable? The second area, though, is the non-bank market financing arena. And that, of course, is where the problems were most apparent in March and April. Uh, and there you've just got a, a big unfinished agenda, uh, which where Biden appointees, I, I'd say more importantly in the SEC probably than at the Fed, are going to need to address what happens at hedge funds, what happens in mortgage REITs, uh, what happens in short-term bond funds uh, that are intermediated with the promise of immediate redemption. That area, I think, is, needs a lot of attention. Uh, and it's, it's not one of simply rolling back what the Trump people have done. It's actually doing something that has, has uh, been crying out for attention for quite some time. So, and you've been saying that for quite some time. If we go back to March and April, one of the issues was overnight borrowing, particularly money market mutual funds. And as I understand it, Randy Quarles, in some ways, your successor himself has said, saying, we have to do something to address this because it seems like we have not got a solution to this and we had to bail them out. Essentially, the Fed had to bail them out once again. Yeah, well, the, you know, the, Fed has, the Fed has been skeptical of the measures that were taken four, five, six years ago on money market funds, that is institutionally. Uh, and, and I think now more and more people are coming to the realization, including Fidelity and Vanguard, that the prime money market fund is just really not a viable business model. But, but David, the issue of, of short-term funding extends well beyond money market funds. That's you know, all the disruptions we saw with, as I said, with hedge funds, with REITs, with other intermediaries, were uh, at least partially because of the dependence they did have on short-term funding, which can get cut off uh, literally overnight and produce the kinds of squeezes that uh, once again have required the Fed to come in and, and provide liquidity to many unregulated entities. That was Dan Tarullo, former Federal Reserve Board Governor. Coming up, President-elect Biden's plan for the nation's schools will start with a cautious approach to reopening schools safely. We talk with former Education Secretary Margaret Spellings. We can understand and help our teachers use technology in, in more uh, fulsome ways and more effective ways. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is a special edition of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Education holds a special place in President-elect Biden's list of priorities. Incoming First Lady Dr. Jill Biden is a community college professor and a member of the nation's largest teachers union. For American educators, this is a great day for y'all. You're gonna have one of your own in the White House. President Trump's education secretary, Betsy DeVos, scaled back federal government involvement in K-12 policy and advocated for charter schools. In addition to reversing DeVos's policies, the Biden administration plans to increase resources for public schools and bridge the funding gap for schools in underprivileged communities. The American people have seen, they've seen how bad things are. To make it easier to start a business, to buy your first home, to pursue an education after high school without being burdened with debt. The pandemic's effects on children and families is putting extra emphasis on the importance of education policy, with many parents pleading to keep schools open. I asked Margaret Spelling's former education secretary under President George W. Bush about the importance of figuring out how to get kids back to school. The functioning of our schools is central to the recovery of our economy and the functioning of our families and uh, not to mention uh, the education of this next generation of students. So COVID and schools are, you know, top of the pyramid. So what can the federal government, as opposed to state or local government, do on that score? Is it mainly just fight COVID overall, or are there specific things that it can do with respect to our schools? Well, it can do a lot. For starters, uh, we can convene experts that can help us 
uh, understand what those proper protocols for health and uh, public health and for student safety are. What are best practices? What are we learning from around the country? Uh, secondly, we can help our educators understand how to use space. Uh, we can understand and help our teachers use technology in, in more uh, fulsome ways and more effective ways. And we can take leadership at the federal level around broadband and device ubiquity. So there's really a lot the federal government can do to respond immediately. How much of it is money? Because I saw that the organization representing superintendents across the school said we need about $200 billion was the number to really help our schools COVID-proof themselves if that's possible. Well, state and local governments need need resources, and I hope that we'll have that uh, in the next CARES package, either through uh, states or through uh, local school districts. But sure, resources are a part of it, not the only part. Can we build and improve our overall education system at the same time we're fighting this this COVID-19 epidemic? I mean, I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that George W. Bush, your old boss, really made education a priority. You really implemented the No Child Left Behind program. Did that work? Do we have to set that to one side, or can we actually, in this crisis, still pursue a fundamental underlying buttressing of our education system? We we absolutely must, because COVID has revealed the systemic you know, inequities in our system that No Child Left Behind attempted to address through investments in reading, through, uh, you know, holding ourselves as adults accountable for the achievement of all students. And, you know, it, it, uh, it really bugs me when I hear people say we need to go back to normal. No, we don't, because normal had, you know, millions of students left behind, if you will, uh, and we have to, you know, reinvent this model to be more responsive to all students. Madam Secretary, you and I have been talking thus far about preschool and K through 12. Let's spend a minute on higher education because that was actually something raised during the campaign. Questions like free tuition and forgiveness of student loans. What do you think is a sensible policy over the next four years with respect to higher education? You know, I think things that will address the immediate needs in the aftermath of COVID around uh, displaced workers, around job training, around getting resources uh, to those individuals, but also alignment between what we in colleges and universities produce and, and the demands of the marketplace today. And so we have a lot of retooling to do. I'm in Texas, uh, an oil and gas industry that is uh, you know, likely to shrink over time in some ways. How do we engage that workforce, retool, retrain, uh, so that those individuals can participate in advanced man manufacturing and, and other uh, fields? You, you talk about the oil and gas industry having to retool and perhaps get smaller. What about higher education? Are we going to see some shakeout, some, some, some consolidation? Because a lot of those institutions of higher learning, as you know so well, are under enormous financial pressure right now. Absolutely. And we're going to see, you know, I think people are, are wrong when they talk about kind of higher education as one monolithic type enterprise. We have just a wide variety from gigantic little cities in our flagship universities to, you know, very customized learning at smaller liberal arts colleges or HBCUs or uh, MSIs, uh, et cetera. And so, yes, they're all under strain. They're all under financial challenge. And we need to reinvent a lot of our models. Uh, we can't be, uh, you know, all things everywhere. And so how do we set our priorities and align our resources around that? Because we know one thing for sure, more people will need education and training, what we offer in American higher education in more affordable, more convenient, and more relevant ways. And it's a great opportunity to reinvent our institutions to respond. That was former Education Secretary Margaret Spellings. Coming up, President-elect Biden's clean energy plan has a big price tag, but former Energy Secretary Ernest Moniz says parts of the energy plan could attract bipartisan support. We all know we desperately need uh, to uh, renew our infrastructure uh, and to build new infrastructure in the energy arena. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is a special edition of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Climate change is one of President-elect Biden's top priorities. He said one of the first things he'll do as president is reverse President Trump's decision to pull the U.S. out of the Paris Climate Accord. While he turns against our allies, I'll bring us back into the Paris Agreement. I'll put us back in the business of leading the world on climate change. 
Here at home, President-elect Biden plans to spend $2 trillion over four years on clean energy, with the ultimate goal of reaching net zero emissions by 2050. There's a range of things we can do. In the end, though, we're not going to set carbon policy or climate policy. Governments are going to do that, and, and the private sector is going to provide the solutions. President-elect Biden's plans to move away from fossil fuels raises the question of jobs lost in the industry. But Mr. Biden says that his focus on renewable energy will create millions of union jobs. This is plan to endorsed by every major, every major environmental group and every labor group, labor, because they know the future lies. The future lies in us being able to breathe, and they know there are good jobs in getting us there. The Biden administration's climate plan faces enormous headwind in a Congress where Republicans have a majority in the Senate. But former Energy Secretary Ernest Moniz under President Obama says there are important things that can be done even if bipartisan support is required. I think there are two major areas uh, where I think there will, be, there will be bipartisan interest in moving the ball forward. Uh, one is uh, the innovation agenda. Uh, the innovation agenda is really core uh, to uh, to really <laughs> ramping up uh, much more uh, than, than we have in terms of addressing uh, clean energy. Uh, and, uh, and the evidence has been there in the last few years, frankly, uh, not in the administration, but in the Congress uh, of uh, pretty good support for uh, increasing the clean energy innovation uh, agenda. The second area, I would say, is uh, energy infrastructure, probably part of a broader uh, infrastructure initiative, uh, we all know we desperately need uh, to uh, renew our infrastructure uh, and to build new infrastructure in the energy arena uh, to manage uh, the uh, different, uh, different kinds of technologies that will be in use. And the first one, if I could, your old shop, the Department of Energy, actually has a fair amount of money each year that they can invest in innovation, as I understand it. It's not clear that under the Trump administration they used it all, but Congress seems pretty open to investing in real R&D and real serious science. Absolutely. The, uh, frankly, in these last several years, the administration budgets that go up to the Hill have typically called for 40 percent reductions, and the Congress has said bipartisan, no thank you, uh, and has actually increased the budgets uh, uh, decently. So we have innovation, we have infrastructure as bipartisan p potential. Let's talk about what the administration can do on its own. The President of the United States with his energy secretary, what can you do? First of all, regulatory repeal. It appears that some of the regulation, uh, regulatory actions are going to cha be changed. Well, uh, certainly, David, executive action uh, is certainly, I, I would project, uh, uh, going to be an important part of this because also because there's no time to lose. And uh, I should say, uh, number one, of course, will be the, the president-elect has said uh, as a day one action uh, would be rejoining the Paris Accord. Uh, but uh, to, re to really reestablish our leadership, uh, that clearly is going to require us to take care of issues at home. And that's where I think your question comes in. Uh, I, I would uh, put these executive actions uh, uh, this again, I'm speaking for myself here. I, you have to, I have to emphasize, but I would kind of put them in three buckets. One is, uh, I might call it uh, back, back to the future, uh, reestablishing the cafe standards, uh, and in doing so, reinforcing uh, what states are doing. Uh, in this case, California pr prerogative, but but in general, st what states and cities are doing uh, will be very different when they are aligned uh, with national uh, uh, administration policy. Uh, another, another would be the, the Department of Energy uh, efficiency standards, uh, which in the Obama administration, Obama-Biden administration, was huge. Uh, it will save almost 3 billion tons of CO2 and over half a trillion dollars of consumer bills uh, by, by 2030. Those have been pretty much dead in the water. I think that's going to be uh, uh, you know, kick-started again. Then there's the rollback, um, uh, especially EPA, uh, uh, actions that have been taken. Uh, I'd mentioned one very prominently would be uh, the control of methane emissions uh, uh, in the end-to-end. -end, uh, uh, it's in many sectors, uh, uh, certainly in the natural gas sector, uh, it's gotten a lot of attention. So I think we'll see clearly uh, that rollback. And the Congress has provided for a new administration, uh, in fact, to uh, alert them to the rollback of various provisions that have been done towards the end of a preceding administration. And finally, I think there's going to be very important areas of advancing 
um, uh, uh, new new things in a certain sense. Uh, in FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, I think we will see uh, much more flexibility given to regions for for carbon pricing. Uh, we'll see regulatory reform for allowing more renewables and and storage, uh, uh, and for creating uh, high voltage uh, transmission lines. Uh, and then in the financial regulatory agencies, uh, we had the recent uh, CFTC, Commodity Futures Trading Commission report that I think is a harbinger for a requiring uh, much more climate uh, risk management and disclosure uh, from, uh, from, from companies. Uh, that of course aligns with the whole ESG initiatives uh, that the private banks are also uh, uh, pushing forward uh, aggressively. So I think we'll see quite a bit of change um, without legislative action. That was former Energy Secretary Ernest Moniz. Coming up, President-elect Biden will inherit a global pandemic and a strained trade relationship with China. I talked with Richard Haas, president of the Council on Foreign Relations, about China's view of a new administration. I don't think they have any great hopes in the sense that this is going to usher in a new age of uh, U.S.-China comity. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is a special edition of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. President-elect Biden is already getting to work on building relationships with the world leaders. I warmly congratulate Joe Biden on his election as the 46th president of the USA. The United States is our closest and most important ally, and uh, that's been the case under president after president, prime minister after prime minister. It won't, it won't change. And I look forward very much to working with President Biden and his team. I wish to congratulate Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. I have a personal, warm and long relationship with Joe Biden for nearly 40 years. I know him as a great friend of the state of Israel. The president-elect has stressed the importance of strengthening cooperation with allies. We're going to need to reinvigorate our democracy at home, strengthen the coalitions <clears throat> democracies we stand with. One of the most important and difficult issues for the new administration would be U.S.-China relations, which have grown more confrontational since the Obama-Biden administration. We make up 25 percent of the world's trading capacity of the economy of the world. We need to be aligned with the other democracies. When President-elect Biden takes office in January, he will have to deal with the nation's allies and adversaries, all while controlling a global health crisis. I talked with Council on Foreign Relations President Richard Haas about the inbox President Biden will face on January 20 and how he can set his priorities. China's in the inbox and it will be for presidents as far as the eye can see or the brain can imagine. It's one of the structural challenges, shall we say, conceivably an opportunity uh, of the 21st century. And as a result, there's no urgency to get it right in the first couple of months. And the contrast there is with COVID. We may not think of uh, a pandemic as a national security priority, but it's exactly that. And unless we get it under control here at home, we're simply not going to have the bandwidth to do much, uh, much of anything uh, else. Obviously, it'll hold back the, uh, the economy. And so I think uh, that becomes the priority. It also, though, has real foreign policy dimensions. There's the question of the U.S. getting back into the World Health Organization. I think that makes sense, even though it's flawed. It's the only way to gradually improve it. I think there's the question of participation in global efforts to produce and distribute and fund any, any vaccine or other uh, therapeutics that, that may emerge. And I also think there's one other foreign policy dimension, David. If we can get COVID gradually under control here, it sends a powerful message that the United States is back, that essentially we can continue to function and that with our technology and despite our political divisions, we can we can still make good things happen in this country. And I think that sends an important message to the world. Let's come back to that U.S.-China relationship, uh, because it doesn't look right now like President Xi's making it that much easier for President-elect Biden as they made that move in Hong Kong that caused the opposition to all resign en masse. What do you think is the Chinese position on uh, Pre Vice President, uh, uh, I'm sorry, President-elect Biden? I don't think they have any great hopes in the sense that this is going to usher in a new age of uh, U.S.-China comity. 
they understand. Indeed, there'll probably be more continuity than than change. Uh, if one looks at the people around by uh, Vice President, President-elect Biden, a lot of them have said or written fairly tough things about China, particularly over human rights. If anything, they'll be tougher than the uh, outgoing administration. You have widespread concerns across the political spectrum on trade-related issues, on, on technology. And some of the people around uh, Mr. Biden have worked in places like the Pentagon and have very strong views about Taiwan or, or the South China Sea or what China is doing on its border with, uh, with India. The one constant here, David, is Xi Jinping's China is a very different China. It's more repressive at home. State ownership is not only continuing but growing in the economy. It's more assertive and more capable in its foreign policy. And I think the Chinese are plowing ahead. This is the trajectory they are on. So so as a practical matter, Richard, what is the, the realistic possibility of having multilateral efforts to really cabin or redirect China at all? Because one of the things you write about in your piece is returning to multilateral efforts to some of the international institutions that we have. Sure. Can that really redirect or even a little bit where China is headed? Oh, absolutely. It's called, you know, since that's what diplomacy is about, the United States has this great structural advantage or uh, potential leverage called its allies and partners. The Europeans could play a big role on things like human rights pressure or uh, technology. Uh, the Asian and Pacific uh, allies could have all sorts of uh, role to play on economics, uh, on strategy. I think there's a real question, though, for the new administration, whether it's prepared to join into what was the Trans-Pacific Partnership and uh, work with other countries in the region to force China to raise its standards whether it's economic standards or, or climate-related standards, in order to have access to half the world's um, markets. So, again, I think the, the real advantage we have is, uh, is, is changing the means of our policy. I think there will be considerable continuity and ends. I think the real difference will be the, the a Biden administration will work much more with our allies, South Korea, Japan, Australia, the Europeans, partners like India, to, 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 to approach China. And I think potentially... Uh, and that's what foreign policy is about. It's to shape the, the foreign policy choices of a country like China. And history suggests that's possible. What's not possible, which is a tack the Secretary of State has been on, is to try to transform China. They're not going to walk away from the Communist Party. They're not going to become liberal Democrats overnight. That is, to me, just folly. But I do think there's a chance we can influence what China does. That was Richard Haas, president of the Council on Foreign Relations. Coming up, we turn to our special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard, to look forward to the surprises, both upside and downside, that may lay ahead in the next four years. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Markets are meant to anticipate what lies around the corner, and we already have a sense of some of what we'll face in the new year and with the new administration. But there's always the unexpected, and for that, we turn to former Treasury Secretary and special Wall Street Week contributor Larry Summers of Harvard, asking him what he thinks the biggest upside and downside surprises may be in the next four years. We might get an upside on productivity like we did in the 1990s. There's been a ton of investments in artificial intelligence, in all kinds of internet-based commerce, in all kinds of telecommunications uh, technology. Businesses have invested very heavily, and you haven't really seen much in the productivity statistics. And a similar thing happened with respect to computers in the 1980s. And then there was a wondrous decade from the early mid-90s through the early mid-2000s when we saw a big acceleration in productivity growth. I'm not predicting it, but it wouldn't amaze me if something like that came out of the uh, technology investments that businesses have been making and the revolutions around uh, artificial intelligence. That would be an important upside if it happened. If we get that upside surprise on productivity, what does that say about growth? Is that really going to give us a, a leg up on growth overall? I think it would translate into a substantial increase in growth, both because more productivity directly translates into growth and because, as in the 90s, more productivity 
lets you run the economy hotter without giving rise to excessive uh, inflation. So I think that supply shocks can be both good and bad, and there's nothing that says you can't have good supply shocks. And we may have a good supply shock. You could think of it as uh, saying that data is the new oil. And if the price of data and the price of processing data comes way down in a way that's actually effective and integrated with businesses, that could turn out to be a significant benefit over the next uh, several years. Again, I'm not confident at all or even predicting that this will happen. But I think in general, we need to be open to both positive and negative surprises. What about a positive surprise like that? How might it be distributed? Because one of the issues that confronts the Biden administration as it comes to office is the growing inequality, something that's been going that way since 1980 or so. Uh, might there be some pleasant surprise in the inequality sub subject? I think there may be. Uh, there's some evidence that uh, the big increases in CEO salaries relative to worker salaries had kind of peaked about a decade ago. There's some evidence that in recent years, there's been some catching up by uh, those at the low end. If you look at the dramatic increase in education differentials, they, the rate at which those education differentials were widening out um, peaked uh, some time ago. So I think it's possible that a combination of the different psychology we're probably going to have with a different Democratic administration, a willingness to run the economy in a very strong uh, way and less concern about inflation than we've had uh, in the past, um, the increase in the minimum wage that we surely uh, should uh, have. And I think there's a chance, even with the current uh, legislative alignment, that we will get an increase in uh, the minimum wage. The growing concerns of corporations with their stakeholders, as well as with uh, their uh, shareholders. I, I think what we know is that these changes in macro trends around uh, inequality are never things we do a very good job of predicting uh, in advance. And so pendulums usually swing. And again, I wouldn't want to confidently predict it, but it wouldn't amaze me if the pendulum swings back somewhat in the direction of uh, working people. Certainly, I think you're likely to see more antitrust enforcement, and that's going to exert some discipline on uh, pricing power, and that will operate to help real wages as well. Okay, so those are some possible, you're not predicting some possible upside surprises. What about a downside surprise? So I think there's real geopolitical risk. Uh, I don't think that we have a framework at this point for our relationship with China. We have a tendency to suppose that a list of demands constitutes a strategy. And there's something not so dissimilar from that happening on uh, their side. So whether it's some island in the South China Sea or some misunderstanding over uh, Taiwan or some issue that arises with respect to uh, technology, I think there's the prospect that uh, the situation with China could come to look uh, much more ominous even than it does today. And that would certainly be consequential uh, for markets. I think there are, uh, I think there are real questions um, about the pandemic. My best guess is, David, that by next September, enough people will have vac been vaccinated that the pandemic will not be a mega factor in all of our lives. But something could go wrong with that vaccination process. The virus could mutate. A new virus uh, could come along. It could turn out that people who have had COVID have more lasting after effects than we appreciate today. 
So I think there are some real risks associated with uh, the long run uh, play out of COVID. And I think the biggest risk is that somehow our government will not become more functional and that gridlock, polarization, inaction and incompetence will somehow continue to be what people see when they see government. And if that happens, God knows what will happen in the 2022 and 2024 elections. And the proposition that government by the people is effective government for the people will come into increasing question. Again, that's not what I expect. I've got lots of confidence in uh, President Biden and certainly the people he's appointed uh, so far are people I have uh, confidence in. But you can't go through what our country's gone through for the last four years and not have some concerns about the basic functioning of government over the next few years. That was special Wall Street Week contributor Larry Summers. Finally, one more thought. Dressing for success in the age of COVID. We've gone through a lot of changes in 2020, and one change that seems here to stay is working from home. And the thing that comes with it, the thing that we love and we hate, the Zoom call or Skype or FaceTime or all of the above. We're spending more time than we could have imagined on video conferences at all hours of the day and night. And we've come to find them both exhausting and convenient at the same time. It does cut down that commute time, doesn't it? The old idea of a commuter going into New York City five days a week may be an idea that's behind us. But with the explosion of video conferencing has come a whole new set of issues, not least of which is, what do we wear? Just Google dressing for Zoom, and you get everything from how to dress for your Zoom meeting in under five minutes to the science behind WFH dressing for Zoom from the Association of Psychological Science. Wall Street Week contributor Jillian Tett of the Financial Times writes in her column that she finds it increasingly rare to see a man wearing a tie on Zoom. And as a trained social anthropologist, thinks it may just be because the tie in the 20th century was a symbol of corporate hierarchy. While the one thing we need as we deal with this pandemic is surely flexibility. The psychologists warn, though, that we do need to do something to signal to ourselves that we're doing serious work. So we shouldn't be wearing those sweats or PJs. Even Mark Zuckerberg, reportedly, is moving toward a nicer version of his hoodies. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. See you next week.